Berkeley new book on the great benefits of debate. Um, first, to improve education in our middle and high schools, better preparing students for higher education, the workplace and life in general. And two, to reduce political polarization and enhance civility in our political conversation. <clears throat> the book is titled Resolved, Debate Can Revolutionize Education and Help Save Our Democracy. The book was released by Brookings several weeks ago. The author is Bob Lighton, a non-resident senior fellow and the Economic Studies Program at Brookings, a program that he had formerly directed. Bob has held senior economic positions in the federal government, served as an advisor to then Senator Joe Biden and is an executive of the Kauffman Foundation and Bloomberg government. Bob is also a practicing antitrust lawyer and had served as principal deputy assistant attorney general at the antitrust division during the Clinton administration. In addition to all of these jobs that he seems to have, Bob was an outstanding high school and college debater. Indeed, the reason I am here tonight is that I had the great privilege to be Bob's debate partner at the University of Pennsylvania over 50 years ago. That's still a staggering thing to say, Bob. It sure is. <laughs> <laughs> Joining Bob in our discussion tonight will be Alex Lennon and Dwight Davis. Alex is a, is a founding member of the Washington Urban Debate League and a member of the board's executive committee. He has been the editor in chief of the Washington Quarterly since 1999 and is author of Democracy and U.S. Security Strategy from, from Promotion to Support. Alex was also a national championship debater at Harvard and had served as a debate coach for many, many years. Uh, Dwight is now in his fourth year as principal of the Brown Education Campus, a Washington DC public school. He is a Mary J. Patterson Fellow of school leadership within the, the DC public school system. He is a strong proponent of bringing debate into the middle school and the high school classroom Dwight is also a Washington Urban Debate League debate dad, and he has a degree in divinity. Um, we will, we're gonna begin this with a series of questions directed to Bob, followed up by comments by Alex and Dwight. <clears throat> I thought when I was preparing this that perhaps in lieu of questions, given the topic, I would simply say, Bob, go. <laughs> and, um, but um, in light of our, our timing, I'll, uh, I'll ask some questions and allow them to go with those questions. Uh, questions from the audience are encouraged. So please type them into the Q&A function and we'll make sure they get asked. 
finally, when all is said and done, we will have final comments by Christine Mahoney, who is the, the, the board chair of the Washington Urban Debate League. And with that, uh, Bob, a few questions. Uh, the, the issues in this book are, are obviously something you've been thinking about for a very long time. What is actually what actually inspired you to write the book? So uh, that's a good question. Um, I address it in the preface, and like most things in life, it was an accident. Even though debate, um, as people will learn when they read the book, debate completely changed my life. Um, I used to stutter um, all the way up until about eighth grade. And it was a friend of my mother who actually got me into debate as a way of curing my stuttering. Uh, the idea, I guess, is similar to throwing a kid in a pool and seeing if they drown. Um, fortunately, I did not drown. And remarkably, within about three tournaments, my stutter had largely disappeared. Uh, and I was a shy, introverted kid, and debate completely changed, changed me, changed my academics, et cetera. So I've always been aware of debate, but I never really thought about writing a book about it until the following thing happened. Um, as, as you said in my introduction, I'm both a lawyer and economist, and I, I write books that nobody reads, all right? <laughs> they're, you know, they're academic books. Typically, three to 5,000 people read books, and mostly are for Brookings or for university presses. And um, I can't really function without writing a book. And in 2016, I was going to write my next book. Um, previous book about that was about economists. It was called Trillion Dollar Economists, and I did a a TED talk based on it, which I'm glad to say has got about 400,000 views. It's a great talk. It's one of the best, one of the highlights of my life, actually doing a TED talk. And so in 2016, I was thinking, I'm going to write a book, another book about economists, but really more about how they influence policy. It was about evidence-based decision-making. And then Donald Trump got elected. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not overstating this, but it was pretty clear to me that uh, there was going to be no audience for evidence-based policymaking or evidence-based anything during the Trump administration. So I had a contract to write this book, and then I lost interest in it. And I told the editors, I'm not going to do it. And so I was scrounging around, figuring out, what am I going to do? And then by total accident, in April 2018, I was going through my Twitter feed, and there was a mention of an article in the Christian Science Monitor about uh, debate in Kansas, where I'm from, and why it was that of all places, Kansas, a totally red state, had produced so many outstanding debaters, even today. And actually that year, two kids from Kansas won the national championship in high school, and they won it again last year as well, different teams. So I read this and a light bulb went on my head. And basically, I realized I could write a book about debate. And then, but I didn't want to stop there. I wanted to be able to say, debate could actually change education. And the thought bubble that went to my head was, imagine if the country, if every citizen in the country had had debate training, would, be, would we be as polarized as we are today? And I think all the debaters here are watching in this have got to agree with me because I've inter interviewed probably 50 to 100 debaters uh, in doing the book. And they all agree with me, of course not. Once you've been in debate, you know both sides. You don't demonize the other side. You don't call people names. You don't lie. You don't do all the kinds of things that we've seen in the last four years, and we wouldn't be in the mess we're in. So that was the motivation for the book. Hmm. What would you say are your main themes in, in, in the book? Well, the main theme of the book, aside from giving people a background in what's happened to the competitive debate, and I have a chapter. And by the way, I was shocked to learn how much debate has changed in 50 years, Don. It has changed <laughs> dramatically. Um, there are many more formats of it, and as many people here on the, uh, on the audience know, um, it has rapidly sped up um, to the point where I think it's actually detrimental. I, I, I don't think talking at 300 or 400 words a minute is good for anybody. Um, and, um, but anyway, I talk about all that. But the main theme of my book is not directed at debaters per se, it's directed at educators. Because the instinct that I had in writing the book was... You know, if we could just somehow insert debate into every classroom, figure out a way to do that, then 
maybe we would have much better educated citizens and also people would be more engaged in, in the classroom. They'd have more fun. Because one thing I do know from my past and I know from my current is that kids love to talk. And if you could structure it in some way, it would actually improve their education. To make a long story short, I found two people in the country who are actually doing this. There's one named Les Lynn in Chicago who runs an outfit called Argument Center Education and another one named Mike Washerman who runs the Boston Debate League in Boston. And between the middle of them, they found a way to what they call debatify the curriculum. In other words, in any class, pick English or civics or history or even biology or science or math, you can use the following paradigm. You can state a claim, you can ask the kids what's the evidence for it, and what's the reasoning that backs up that evidence, which is basically what we all learn in debate. And you don't have to change the curriculum. You don't need a new textbook. You just take the existing materials that you have and structure it around claim evidence reasoning, to which there is some pedagogical um, literature. And that is what the book is about. It's about that if we change education, and it's largely about Les and Mike about how they do that, and it gives very practical examples, if we could do that in more schools around the country, we would improve education, we would improve people's adaptability, you know, adaptability to the workforce, and we'd make them better citizens. And in the future, maybe in 30 years, our country would not be so polarized. Um, maybe even sooner, on the thought being that kids who take debate would come home, they talk to their parents about what they learn in school, and eventually, maybe, maybe the temperature of our conversation would, would die down, and we'd have a more civil society. So those are my basic messages. How, how would debate provide a superior, superior political and educational environment for the country overall? Well, I think the reason is, um, as I said, it teaches debate teaches not to demonize. It teaches us to reason, not to go by emotion. Um, and, you know, people, a lot of people have asked me since I've written the book, how can you claim that it would depolarize our society when, if you look at the end of my chapter one, I list a number of famous debaters, all right? And included in that list, they're not all political people, all right? There are some famous business people, actors, et cetera, and so forth. But there are two people at the opposite ends of the political spectrum, Elizabeth Warren and Ted Cruz. Both were championship debaters. And they asked me, how could we have such a how can you claim that we'd have such a polarized society if you if debate produced somebody on the essentially on the extreme right and somebody who is very, very progressive on the left? My answer to that is that if you have an audience full of debaters, namely voters, and they've all been educated, politicians would respond. They wouldn't go to the extremes because a debate audience would be much more centrist, much more willing to compromise, would not stake out such extreme positions. Because the reality is, I don't have to tell you, probably less than 1% of the voter population has had debate training, less than that. And we debaters know that you, you can't run a society basically at one extreme or another. There are too many talking points in between. And so that's the premise of my book. The book was published about six weeks ago, is that right? What has, what has the reaction been to the book? Uh, from the community, community at large? Well, so far I've had a lot of interesting social media conversations and so forth, but the two most important pieces of feedback I've gotten are from school, people who wanna change the school system. And this is what I'm now doing. I am now in the process of trying to enlist and get foundation funding so that we can basically instruct more teachers in what Mike and Les are doing in Boston. They can run a summer institute in one week and essentially take any teacher who hasn't had debate training and enable them to run a class through a debate kind of structure. And then if they have some monitoring during the course of the year, which is the way that uh, Mike and Les do it, you can basically help them um, as they get experienced. And what Mike and Les have found is it probably takes two or three years for teachers to be really experienced in debate. And, deliver the instruction of the kind that I talk about in my book. So that is my main motive now. And in fact, I'm just giving people on the a heads up here on the, on the Zoom. I bought an ad uh, uh, or helped buy an ad for something called the Ethics Project, which is in St. Louis. 
and they're going to run an ad in the NEA uh, weekly or NEA newsletter in January, which will reach 2.4 million teachers. And it will invite them to come to a webinar at which I will explain to them how to teach through debate. And then hopefully be able to have through their schools, through professional development funds, be able to spend maybe $1,000 to $1,500 per teacher and send them to debate instruction school. I call it debate center education. And then get Mike and Les and the people that are around them, help educate these teachers and teach them over the summer. And by the way, final point, this works great in remote learning environments. Because one of the things you find out about debate, of course, we know that kids are shy. A lot of kids do not have English as their first language. And so they're very reluctant to get up there in front of 30 kids and start talking. And what, what essentially Argument Centered Education and what BDL have done, is they found a way to gradually introduce students to debate techniques without making them terrified. They split up the classroom into small little circles. And before kids get up in front of the class, they've had a lot of training before they actually get up and talk to 30 people. Well, the point about remote learning is this, we're talking to a computer and the kids today grow up in an, in an era where they're more comfortable talking to a, a screen than they are talking to human beings. And ironically, I think Mike and Les have had the experience that kids that are doing debate, uh, uh, you know, debate centered instruction right now are actually doing it better remotely than they may be doing it in a classroom. So I think the pandemic, ironically, is a perfect time to do this because kids are not afraid of talking to a computer. I, I um, want to ask Alex to speak to this, <clears throat> but it does seem from our own experience that the virtual debate process has really been very successful, including the camp. And um, that that is a very, very good point. And again, you know, if there's a silver lining to the pandemic, this may indeed be it. Alex, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, hi, Don and Bob. Thanks for doing this and to everyone who's listening. I My sense is, is that Bob's on to the right aspect, which is that the barriers to entry through online debating are lower. It's easier when there's less pressure, when you're not quite sure, or there's not an audience staring you in the face. I mean, I was very struck by what Bob was talking about from his own experience, uh, that for me personally, I could not stand speaking in public. And what changed it for me was the competitive nature of debate actually taught me to stop processing vision because I was thinking about so many different things in the debate itself. And I actually didn't even realize that I had done this until after seeing a picture of an audience watching one of our debates and there were 200 people in the room. And this was about four months after the debate had happened. And I literally had no idea that there was anyone in the judge in the room other than the five judges. Mm -hmm. So that barrier to entry through the computer, I think is right. In the competitive aspect, I think it may have some law, may be hard to retain some people who really value the social aspect of being together with, especially right. with competitors from other schools or other areas. But in the confines of what Bob's talking about in an educational environment, when you're trying to teach the basic skills to get involved in the first place, I do think it's a lot easier. I, I don't think you see that downside that you might for the high level competitors that don't get to see their friends from across the country on weekends like they used to. Dwight, from your perspective in the trenches, what do you think of Bob's proposal? I think that, uh, well, first, thank you all for having me here. I, I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, I, I do think that um, Bob's argument has a lot of validity. Um, my wife uh, is also a, a national uh, debater and champion. Um, she debated in high school. She went on to Columbia and won the uh, Frederick Douglass MOOC competition. Um, my son is currently uh, an eighth grader. Uh, at Hewan Brown Education Campus, um, and he is an avid debater, although um, initially uh, it, it, it was more of a, um, a big push on our end to get him involved, uh, but we have seen his, his evolution. Uh, he is someone who is uh, soft-spoken as well, um, but, but I think ultimately, right, so as I think about this, I think about our past debate teams and um, you know, when we go, when we attend the debate competitions, our scholars, you know, 
They're not wearing suits like other team members are. They're wearing jeans. They're wearing their nice sweaters. Um, and there's a moment, and and every year there's this moment when our when our team realizes that hey, it's not about what you have on. It's not about how 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 nice your your briefcase is. It comes down to critical thinking. And in those moments, they realize, hey, if I if I know the content and I can run my argument, I have a shot, right? And I think that is the beauty of it, right? It, it gives students an opportunity to, to be competitive, um, to show what they know, to listen intently, um, to show how quickly they can think, um, how quickly they can turn arguments around. Um, and it's, it's been wonderful. The, the scholars in our, in our school who have been involved in debate have, have, have shown the most dramatic um, academic gains um, that we've seen. Um, and my, uh, my debate coach hates when I say that, but it's absolutely true um, because she feels like it puts so much pressure on her, but uh, debate is, is, is a game changer. Now, the, the, one of the things that, that for me though, is that you know, when you're in a school district that has so many uh, initiatives and so many um, uh, mandates, right? Um, there is, um, there, like, so we have debate as a club right now. And so you have to grow teacher capacity. It, it, takes, te it takes a teacher, I think in te in, um, the new teacher project said that it takes an educator somewhere between five to seven years to, be, to become what they call it irreplaceable, right? So it takes time. So, you, so for me, it's growing this program in its infancy and building it and building it and building it and then getting teachers on board, right? So that that is for me the most difficult part. But when um, uh, when Bob talks about you know having these um, sessions where teachers can go and learn, that 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 is phenomenal. But it's for me, I need to for me for for debate to be successful at Brown, I need to have a proof point. I need to have a group of students who have shown that they can grow and and and, and do this phenomenal work. And that is often what gets teachers much more involved because then teachers want to know, okay. You had this great success. How do I do that? Don, can I interject something here? Sure. So just to follow up Dwight's point. So I talk in the book, there have been several formal statistical studies of the impact of competitive debate, especially on urban kids, uh, uh, mostly, mostly, black, mostly black kids um, in both uh, Chicago and in Baltimore. And you control for what's called self-selection, namely kids that are already inclined to be great debaters are gonna be great debaters, all right? There are efforts to control for that statistically. And even when you control for that, it proves exactly what Dwight is saying, that the competitive debate has a remarkable effect in improving the academic performance of the kids who participate. So that you, there's, there's broad statistical evidence for what you said. That's point one. Point two, um, I talk about Boston, Chicago in the, in the book, but I actually went there, all right? And I saw these, these classes that had debate you know, as a way of doing claim evidence reasoning and so forth. And I saw it in multiple classrooms. And then I, you know, I would look at one classroom that was doing it and then I go down the hall and I would peek in and I'd look at another classroom. And these are mostly kids, these are title one schools, you know, um, and these kids, you know, in many cases are already one or two grade levels behind, you know, perhaps you know, a rich white suburban uh, a school in the, you know, in the suburbs. And you look at those classes that have debate instruction and there is like excitement and buzz. I mean, it is like a different world to walk into those classes and then compare them to a class where all the teacher is doing is trying to teach and then lecturing and half the kids are asleep and they're running, you know, they're, 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 there's disorder in the classroom, et cetera. I'm not telling you guys anything that you don't already know, but there is, almost universal rapt attention in the, in the classes that have debate center instruction. The kids are, they're, they're broken up, as I said, in groups of six, and then eventually they come back in groups of, of 30, and there's like a buzz. They're all excited. They're all talking to each other. They're all saying, no, you're wrong. No, there's this and that and so forth. And the materials is a completely different atmosphere. And that's what really converted me. I mean, that's the thing that really excited me when I saw it in practice. And I know this can change education. And that's why for teachers, it's a gift to be able to teach through debate because it means that you don't have to lecture all the time. You can basically have the kids teach each other 
and you can do it in a constructive way so you don't ever tear anybody down. And that's something else that I learned through the teachers. Um, they, don't t they don't say you're wrong or whatever. They always are saying, well, can somebody else come up with a better idea? Or is there a better explanation? Or is there a better source you can cite and so forth? And it's always about improvement, never demeaning the kids, which I found to be very important. And then I'll give you a final point about this. When you start the school year, these kids, of course, they're scared to death. They don't want to talk, et cetera. And the way you start teaching debate is through very simple propositions, like get them to debate, are dogs better than cats? Or, you know, is soccer better than basketball? Or something that they're familiar with. Will you get them to at least in conversational mode? And then you ask them why? What's your evidence for that? What's your reasoning for that? And once they get into that mode within a month, you can then have them actually start debating things like, you know, is the character in this particular book a tragic figure or is it some other kind of person or whatever? They can, in other words, they can translate that experience to something that's much more educational. And the teachers love it because they don't have to lecture. They can, as I said, bring the subject material out through the courses of these, through the course of the debates. Alex, on the political side, um, how can scholastic debate um, increase or civilize the level of public discussion? So I'm glad you asked because what struck me, if you, I'm always as an editor, someone who looks at the table of contents before I read a book to really get the gist of the argument. That's the structure for the argument. It's literally the outline, which is one of the first things you learn in debate is how to make it. And Bob's book follows sort of a very simple three-step process at the beginning, which is the lessons from the competitive activity. How do, the second is how to improve education, drawing on those lessons, bringing it into the classroom on an everyday basis. So it's not just the kids that crisscross the country or the state in a competitive format. And the third is the democracy aspect. And there, I think particularly now, one of the greatest problems we're finding is these polarized information bubbles where you just listen inside your own sphere of people who already agree with you. And most people, and in, intellects don't understand this, most people like the reinforcement that knowing they were right already. It's not a challenge on ideas. It's a, it's a comfort level in absorbing the environment around you that you're already right. And that forces us deeper into polarized information bubbles, whether it's the Fox News watchers or the MSNBC watchers or whatever the case may be. The key that you find in debate is what David Brooks of the New York Times called lateral research. You have to understand what the other side's argument is. And the way that Bob's table of contents strikes this is you can see it, chapter six, is objections and challenges to debate-centered instructions. What's the other side's arguments? I have to understand what your argument is if I'm gonna beat you. And then I've gotta go in the next debate and pick up your side of the debate and beat you in reverse. That understanding of what an other side's argument is, even if you don't ultimately agree with it, is the fundamental key to democracy. It's a respect for the other side's argument, a respect for the different opinions that someone else has, for the perspectives, the priorities, whatever drives them to that opinion that's different than yours. If you don't have that in a democracy and you're embedded in your shell, you're lost. And we're seeing the results of that transition right now is a lack of transition in the presidential transition. Yes. You have to get that cross side over. I got an exposure to this early because I have a Republican father who listens to Rush Limbaugh and a British mother who works for the UN. So I've been raised in this from well before going into debate. But most people don't have that environment. And if you don't, you lose the ability to see the other side and you lose the respect for the democratic process. That's the political side of this argument to me. Well, I think seeing the other side or being able to argue the other side is really the key component to both debate and then later things in life. There were, there were far too many lawyers out there who cannot see the other side of the argument. That's always confounded me because that's what it's all, you know, you learned that as a 14 year old in debate. And all of a sudden, you know, people are telling you, well, you can't make that argument, they're bad people. Um, and their argument's perfectly proper. 
and you they, they start to find that out when a judge rules against them in the process. So um, yeah, I, I think that that really is a, a key point. There have been a couple questions have come in. Uh, well, we hey, Don, Don, can, can I add something to that very quickly? Sure. So, so the, the, I think what Alex said is, is so uh, profound. Um, you know, being able to understand another person's perspective and kind of tying that into what, what Bob spoke about um, as a fifth grade teacher, um, and, and you know, I had a wife who was a debater and she encouraged me to bring debate into the classroom. Um, however, the key was for my scholars, it had to be relevant. And I feel like that is another key of debate is that oftentimes students are, debate, are debating relevant topics, right? And so for me, um, you know, we would read books um, by Sharon Flake, Sharon Draper, uh, Christopher Paul Curtis, um, uh, uh, um, so many different authors and students would become so mesmerized by these uh, historical figures. And then as time went on, we, you know, we read another book called The Breadwinner that talked about the story of a young lady uh, who lived in a war-torn country. And so we, I would pose questions. So what would this character say to Malcolm X? What would this person say to uh, William Brown? What would this person say to this person? And because the students were so uh, engaged in the characters and the content in the historical context, we could then have these broader discussions that brought that excitement that Bob was talking about in the classroom. And I, however, it took me seven, eight years to get to the point where I actually understood how to make this happen. But that is the power of debate. To this day, I have students who come to who find me at Brown and say, Mr. Davis, I'll never forget this particular book, or I never forget this particular conversation. I love this. And it's almost like it's, I, I hear you all saying some of the same things about how debate radically changed your life. And I, I just, you know, I, I do think that there is an inherent power in debate, um, especially if we can get teachers trained and to understand how pivotal it is, how it can uh, just radically change the, the, the trajectory of many students. I remember ha having a national problems teacher in school who obviously had not kept up with um, current events. And at the end of the year, he, he requested of the principal that he not be allowed to have any, any debate kids in his class in the future because they know too much. And they're, they're really into this stuff and they make him look bad. And um, my reaction as a wise guy, 18 year old was, well, he should look bad. <laughs> you know, the guy really didn't want to, uh, didn't want to push further in, into the process. And the, the, the uh, component of debaters in the class just ate his lunch every day. <laughs> it was a fun class. Uh, all right, let, let's get to the questions uh, that have come in. First one. Uh, can you talk more about the way that debate can help a young person develop a civic identity? Now, even before we get to a civic identity, let's just talk about confidence, mm -hmm. right? And um, because so many kids, you know, I mean, I mean, I was one, but there are zillions. They just don't have confidence in themselves. And... Uh, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book, I, I did a, a Google search um, in writing the book and the search was, what is the thing that scares people the most? Okay. And obviously, you know, death, death is high on the list. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the number, either number two or number three thing on the list was fear of public speaking. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, people are more afraid of public speaking than they are of almost anything even jumping out of airplanes. Uh, and so imagine yourself, go back to yourself being a little kid, 10 years old, scared to death, et cetera. One of the things that I saw in, in these classrooms, you know, and you start out with very simple discussions is oral expression is completely different than writing. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you're able to orally articulate an argument, you really 
don't understand what you're talking about. If you can't do it. In fact, it's, I would say it's even more important. The, the better orderly you are, probably the better writer you'll be. And uh, so I would say that the debate skills by developing oral skills through baby steps, which is what these classes do, um, eventually makes kids more confident, makes kids more engaged. They want to learn. And I argue in the book, this is very important for their life skills because, you know, in the 21st century, people are going to have 10 or 15 jobs and you're going to constantly have to upgrade your skills in order to keep pace with technology. And people who don't have the desire to continue to learn are going to fail in our society. One of the reasons we have such polarization right now is we have half the country has been left behind by technological change and they're angry as hell. And I, I can understand that, but it's going to only get worse. And so, even while it's great to learn computer coding, if you don't have the mindset where you want to actually learn, you're screwed. And I think the best way to get that mindset is get debate because it gets you excited about education and makes you want to learn. And that'll make you into a good person and that'll make you into a good citizen. Okay. Yeah, I, so I, that to me is exactly right on that the foundation is in confidence. What I would add onto that is two things that I found, and this is to some extent from the competitive activity, but also just from the process itself. One is the exposure that debate gives you to different ideas. You don't know what engages you civically or what you care about the most or what matters to you the most until you understand what the issues are that are being debated and that are of concern to you. My son, who's now a, a <coughs> excuse me, a first year in college, was a band kid when he was throughout high school. And sometime over the course of the last year, he has become completely obsessed about climate change. And it's because as he entered into the process to sort of get out of that bubble of the world that he was in, not being a debater and understand what matters to him. So the first is what issues you engage in. And the second I think is the association of working with other people. To some extent, the experience that you can have in these summer camps and getting teams of people all working on research structures and building that together gives you the power of association that a lot of really good intellectual students feel like they're on an island, especially in high school when they're on their own and they're so much more engaged or smarter or whatever the case is. In order to be civically engaged, you need to be engaged in a group. It can't be something that you do on your own. So without that exposure to new ideas and that association of working with other people, in both those cases, I think debate's a way that brings you into more of your own identity. Not that you can define it ahead of time, but you develop it through the process. Well, um, the air of confidence is really important. And the thing I, I loved about your website and about how you treat your students is you call them all scholars. And I, I think that's really a compelling situation. But I don't know if you've got a comment on the civic identity issue. Well, I think I, you know, I think there are many students who, you know, come to, to, to our school with many, with varied identities, right? Um, and, they, and they embrace these identities because they don't know who they are. And I've, I've seen, I've watched students um, come to understand who they are, who they can be through debate, right? Because, you know, maybe they have the gift of gab, you know, maybe uh, they have a way of turning phrases on their head and making their friends laugh. And that, that, that ability, right, that unique ability is harnessed in debate. And now they're seen as brilliant, right? And so they want to grab onto that identity. Um, so so I, I, I do think it is about our civic responsibility. I do think it, it is about democracy, but I also think fundamentally, it is about identity, right? For some students, debate is that gateway, that, that, that mechanism that helps them to figure out who they are and what they believe and what is right. Um, and I keep on going back to what Bob said, you know, it, it, it requires, like from my perspective, like I would love for this to be, you know, that thing that, that changes everything for my scholars. At the same time, you know, we have to temper that with, you know, how do I get my teachers trained? How do I create a pipeline to get these teachers to cultivate and develop these skills very quickly um, to do this for, you know, my scholars? 
Another audience question. As a person who's an outsider to the debate world, please bear with me through this question. Is there a particular style of debate that would seem to be most impactful for students to learn? A particular style that the panelists think would be effective in making our world less polarized? If anyone is interested, okay. quite, quite a question. Yeah, it's a good question. and. I won't bore people. I actually go in the book and discuss all the many styles of debate which have flowered since Don and I debated. Uh, when we debated, there was only one kind of debate. It was called policy debate. Um, and, that is, and that is the um, basically, you know, standard format. In, in our day, it was five minutes and then it was 10 minutes of speech and five minutes of the rebuttal and so forth. Um, and um, there were alternative forms where there was cross-examination and so forth. But I talk in the book, as I said earlier, that policy debaters today have sped up so much. And it was a large response to the, um, what was called the spread defense um, in negative. Um, actually, after Don, Don and I finished school in about the mid 70s, uh, the negative side of, 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 the, of, of any debate learned that if what they did was just literally throw the kitchen sink of every conceivable argument they could think of as fast as they could, then it would, they would win the debate because the way you would flow the arguments, the affirmative wouldn't answer half the arguments. So the only way the affirmative could respond is to speed up and respond. And you, that's why you end up in policy debate, kids talking three or 400 words a minute, you can't understand what they're saying. So I would not advocate that for the classroom, certainly. Normal speaking uh, pace, maybe a little bit faster. There are forms of debate like parliamentary debate, um, and um, uh, various, there are various other forms. There's, there's, there's Lincoln, uh, Lincoln uh, Douglas debate I talk about. But basically, forget all that stuff in terms of competitive debate. If you just go through what I call the claim evidence reasoning paradigm, if you can just get people on any subject in three or four minutes to say, you know, what's your claim, what's your evidence for it, and why, and get them to answer that. And if they can do that on any topic and they learn how to do that, there is, they're good to go. So I am going to take issue with Bob and have a little debate on our own okay. panel here, because clearly, <laughs> if it's not already obvious, I am part of the speed problem. <laughs> that is not something that has developed recently in debate. I uh, debated in college in the late 80s, early 90s. That was part of the era after debate had sped up significantly. Somebody actually did um, clock the number of words per minute, not just that we read, but throughout the entire speech that we had in the national finals. And my partner and I were at 320 per minute in that debate. Um, and it is meant for a trained ear. It is not the introductory way. And I think the question is right. And the, the answer I would give in general is different students are going to engage in different types of activity of the activity for different reasons. In public forum, it's a great way to, to practice your persuasive speaking, to get up in front of an audience for the first time, to do a couple of different topics over the course of the year and get a breadth of uh, ideas and topics that you're exposed to. Lincoln Douglas is gonna be different because they're one person debates. And some people are gonna be much more comfortable debating solo rather than having a partner and having to deal with all of the communication issues, the coordination issues, the reliance on somebody else to make those arguments. And other people want someone to share the burden, share the pain, share the process with them. What policy debate always did for me is it forces you to think fast. You have to think quickly. You have to research deep into these arguments. So if you have an entire topic like we do on criminal justice reform now, it forces you in order to get through all the debates to go deep into the literature, cover a variety of different arguments and not kind of skim across the surface of it. Now, that doesn't mean that if you are a, you know, a depth person that you do policy and if you're a breadth person you do public forum, because there are other reasons for it, but that is one way to look at it. And to me, I have always felt that the speed at which I think was directly a consequence of the speed at which I had to talk during debate. Didn't train me for public speaking well. If anything, it's gonna be for auctioneering, but the thinking process that comes in handy on another basis has been irreplaceable for me and I would not have gotten it any place else. But different 
aspects of the activity are going to be right for different people. And so I think the ultimate answer to Elise's question is whatever is most engaging for the students, whatever you can expose them to and get them through that gateway to get that basic three-step process that Bob has outlined, all the differences among the activity after that is gravy. All of them are based on that same basic process and that's what's helpful. And we don't disagree. <laughs> We had a malfunction here. Hi, Don. This is Sierra. Um, is it with the with the questions? Yeah. Um, I have them pulled up here. Uh, if you just click Q and A, um, they should pop up. Let me know if you'd like me to um, read the next question for you. Did we lose John? Not for long, he's coming back. Yeah. Sorry, just bear with us, folks. Okay. Are we back? Yes. And if you click Q&A, are you able to see the questions again, Don? I see the question. I have no open question. I can see, I can see one. But we're close to the time. We, I think you want to turn it back yeah, anyhow. We are. Do you want to take one more question? Yeah. yeah. There's a, I see the question. It says, are there any tips or potential pitfalls introducing debate and getting a program started in school or in a school district? And actually, that's better, that's better for, I think, Dwight to answer. I hate to pass it on, but he, he probably knows more than I do, certainly today. Well, I think... Um, when you think about uh, debate within the classroom, I think one of the issues is um, training, right? Like, um, you know, I stumbled upon, like as a, as a fifth grade, I taught fifth grade for 11 years. And, you know, in, in about my sixth or seventh grade year, I started to learn how to actually uh, incorporate debate within the classroom. Um, there's some work, I know uh, Chicago was mentioned, uh, Massachusetts, Boston was mentioned, um, but there's also some uh, great work being taking place in Atlanta as well. And that's why I was introduced uh, to debate uh, across the classroom. And I implemented some of those strategies, but it, it took time. I, I think one of the biggest issues is, is training. Um, you, you have to have money to train educators. You don't wanna you know, train an educator one year or one month and then it's over. You want to have regular continuous um, training. You wanna have uh, continuous training that also includes coaching, right? It's, it's like, um, I always make sports analogies because in my mind, they are some of the best, right? Like you, like for example, Serena, um, her dad didn't just take her to the tennis court one time. He took her every day and he constantly gave her feedback to improve her practice. So with something like debate that has so much potential, um, you really wanna make sure you have an individual who's committed, but you also wanna give them the structure and the support that they need to grow their practice. And you want to be able to send them to other people in Boston and in Chicago and in Atlanta. You want to, them to be able to see other schools where this is happening because that is what um, really gets this going, right? So um, I'm happy that um, Bob is actually looking to find some individuals who are willing to fund this because I do think I do think it's worthwhile. But the issue for many teachers is if you want me to do this, show me where it's happening, show me where it's going well, and teach me how to do it, right? Exactly. Um, and, and that's one of the most important keys. Okay, unfortunately, I don't think we can get to the rest of the questions, uh, but uh, thank you all for sending them along. Uh, before Chris um, does her PBS thing, um, I have one more question, Bob. You dedicate the book to Atticus and Melanie? Yeah. Who are Atticus and Melanie? I know you're going to brag, so. They're my grandchildren, and I hope, you know, when they grow up, I'll probably be gone, but hopefully they'll read the book and they'll become debaters. So. <laughs> Next Very generation. Good. Yeah, I noticed that. Um, Chris, do you want to um, say a few things? 
Sure. Th thanks, Don. And thank you to all the panelists uh, for putting this on. Um, I am the chair of the Washington Urban Debate League, and I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, the league. And one of the questions was, how can you help? I'll give you some directions on how you can get involved here in Washington, in the Washington, D.C. area. As of today, the Washington Urban Debate League serves 55 schools and over 500 students across the Washington, D.C. area through our after school debate program. We actually also serve even more students, roughly 5,000 through our debate in the classroom efforts. Through public debates, monthly tournaments, a prestigious summer camp that was mentioned earlier, and our travel team, Woodle students are able to access opportunities that may not be available to them otherwise. Today, debate is one of the few extracurricular activities that are available to students. And we're lucky to be able to maintain a sense of community for our debaters, debaters while still remaining socially distant. All of this work is only possible through the support of our donors and our volunteers. You can support Moodle today by purchasing a signed copy of the book we just spent all this time talking about for $50. The majority of the proceeds of that will go directly to the league. There's also a link in the chat function uh, where you can purchase uh, the book and Woodle will mail it to you directly. You can also donate directly to the Washington Urban Debate League through the link that's also in the chat function on the Zoom call, or you could visit our website, urbandebatewashingtondc.org. Uh, thank you all for your support. We appreciate it greatly and we look forward to bringing even more debate to DC public schools. I'm going to turn it back over to Don just to wrap up. All right, Chris, thank you very much. And thank you all for participating, the people on, online. Uh, we very much appreciate your interest and your efforts. And uh, hopefully you will be more, become more involved in the league, as Chris noted. Uh, to uh, Alex and to, uh, to Dwight, Thank you so much for jumping in and being part of this. You added dramatically, I think, to the, to the value of the program. <clears throat> and Dwight, keep those young scholars coming there. That is really, really our future. And finally, Bob, it only took us 50 years to do this, but uh, I really appreciate your effort and your help for the league and Anything we can do to help you in your efforts as you go forward, we're here. All, all you need to do is call. Um, and with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. My voice was a little raspy, but I think we got through it pretty well. Um, and my technology skills are poor, but we, we all knew that already. Um, when Bob and I used to debate, there were dinosaurs roaming the earth, so we didn't have to worry about this technology stuff. Just use plain old good index cards. Um, all right, well then, um, thank you all. And uh, we'll see you again soon, hopefully. Bye.